Hello, good morning. My name is Laura Dawson. I'm the director of the Canada Institute. The great challenge with these trilateral events is to decide, to decide what time to start on. Do we start on Canada time, 10 minutes early, <laughs> with an apology? Do we start on US time, right on time, darn it? Or do we start on Mexico time, which may be a little bit later? <laughs> so we're, we're combining the best of the three. I'll let, let you figure, figure that out, which is the best of the three. So welcome. I am delighted that we are hosting our, uh, our North American Energy Forum. There are, with, with my good friend Duncan Wood and our friends at the Mexico Institute, there are so many interesting and important questions to do with North American energy right now. And it is one of the few issues, as a North Americanist, it's one of the few issues where there are strong trilateral interests, linkages, and collaboration. I was at a trade policy um, seminar uh, a event in Regina, Saskatchewan this weekend. And it, it occurred to me, and I, I told the audience there, and I'll tell you now, that I think that energy and climate change are the most important international trade issue that our three countries are facing. And unless we get the policy right, unless we get the competitiveness right, um, we are really going to, you know, we're going to sink together or we're going to rise together, depending on how we handle this important issue. So I am delighted that once again, Wilson Center is out front on these issues. We are live webcasting, so hello Ottawa, hello Regina, hello Guadalajara, hello Mexico City. We're, uh, we're out there talking to our, our uh, collective community. Um, a few housekeeping tips. Uh, washrooms, of course, are in the corners of every floor in this building. Regrettably, there is no food and drink allowed in the building, so I'm just not looking at that lady who's walking <laughs> with a cup of coffee that we're, the rest of us are staring at enviously. Um, <laughs> We, because we are all policy wonks and professionals, we're not going to take sustained meal breaks in this program today. We're going to have a snack time a little bit later. Uh, if you really need some serious sustenance before 1.30 today, there is a cafeteria uh, located just in the corner there. You're welcome to go in and grab yourself a, uh, a sandwich or something. We have a nice dining room out the other side, or you can go down to the Reagan Building um, cafeteria. Uh, washrooms and food, the two most <laughs> important human uh, elements looked after. We are live feeding, as I mentioned, and tweet. Please, tweet like a mad person. Uh, we have a hashtag up there. Do we have a hashtag? Uh, we're just, do we have a hashtag? What? what what's our hashtag? NA Energy, hashtag NA Energy, or tweet through your very favorite uh, uh, Wilson Center organization at Canada Institute or at Mexico Institute. Without further ado, I am delighted to turn the substantive part of the program over to my, my friend and colleague, Duncan Wood, director of the Mexico Institute. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you here. Um, I would like to begin uh, our session today just by uh, making a very special thank you to, to my staff who have put in an extraordinary effort over the past few days. I generally forget to thank my staff, which makes me a terrible boss. But I have to say, I've seen the pressure that they've been under recently, and I fear that uh, there may be a mutiny unless I show some kind of human sensitivity um, to the things that I'm putting them through. So uh, this is me being uh, penitent and very, very grateful. Uh, ladies, thank you very, very much for everything that you do for us. Uh, Andrea, Angela, Jimena is back there. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank our partners. Mexico Institute is very, very lucky um, to have uh, members of the board and expert input, input from companies such as ExxonMobil, Hunt, Noble, Pioneer, Shell, and Grupo Bal, um, uh, sort of a new player in the energy space in, uh, in Mexico um, uh, through their uh, subsidiary of Petrobal. Uh, and actually, the interaction that we have with those board members is incredibly important in helping to shape our, our programming. Thank you to you for supporting. It's very great uh, to see uh, people coming out for a North America event. As Laura said, it's difficult when you're dealing with both Canada, Mexico, and the United States to actually identify what your audience is. And I'm sure that what we'll see is as, as we move from Mexico, uh, sorry, from North America to Mexico and then to Canada, we'll actually see people coming and going throughout the day. So uh, it's, uh, it's very nice to have you here early on to listen to this, uh, this opening panel. Um, our speakers today, we're very, very lucky. I'll talk about our speakers here on this first panel in just one second. But uh, you know, let me just mention that we do have Cesar Hernandez, the Undersecretary uh, for Electricity, uh, coming in uh, at 10.15 to, to give a keynote. And the head of the, the CRE regulatory agency um, from Mexico, Guillermo Garcia Alcocer, um, we're, we're very fortunate to have been supported by them 
uh, in their attendance. David Goldwyn, a, an expert resident here in D.C. that you know, and of course our dear friend uh, Jeremy Martin, who has come all the way from sunny San Diego um, to, to be with us today, uh, who will moderate uh, the conversation later on. So we've got some really top-notch speakers for you, so please stick around um, for the, uh, the, uh, the, the panels later on today. I um, want to mention that we have uh, more energy events coming up later on uh, in, in the fall. Actually, at the beginning of October, we will have uh, Carlos de Regules, the head of the ASEA uh, a regulatory agency, uh, will be with us on the afternoon of October 3rd. I believe that's a 2 p.m. Uh, start that we'll have here. Um, and negotiating right now with Jose Antonio uh, González Anaya, um, head of Pemex. Um, luckily, he's a big fan of think tanks, and so he wants to come and get his uh, his 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 wonky fix uh, up here in Washington. So we're we're trying to get him to come in uh, sometime in October. Um, we also have new papers being written on energy, um, focusing on supply and demand issues in North America, uh, the cooperative mechanism between the three governments, uh, critical infrastructure security in the energy sector, um, the challenges facing the Mexican energy reform uh, now that we've actually seen implementation fully underway, um, and uh, a paper on Mexico, uh, Mexican oil and, uh, and petroleum markets, which we're excited about uh, unveiling very, very soon. If we look at what's happening in global markets uh, at the moment, we do see that, of course, there is this uh, element that, uh, that demand remains strong, but, of course, we have a lot of supply as well. And it's a competitive marketplace uh, out there right now. A lot of people, a lot of companies, a lot of countries uh, are producing. And when I say energy, I'm not just talking about oil and gas. I'm talking about all of the options that are there for actually generating electricity um, uh, from uh, conventional and renewable sources. Um, we've seen falling prices, of course, but we've also seen a stabilization of prices. Um, two years ago when we had this event, we were talking about the beginning of the, of the, uh, the drop in, in, in energy prices. This time last year, we were like, well, the energy price is going to be low for a long time. And now we're kind of like, well, is this sort of price mark something that we can live with, which is you know, sustainable for the next few years? We've, of course, seen rapid innovation in the energy sector, um, partly driven by the low price environment, uh, partly driven by just the overall need to uh, or desire to cut costs. Uh, uh, collective action, cooperation uh, issues in the uh, in energy markets, most uh, obviously, of course, seen uh, amongst OPEC members, um, which is having far-reaching uh, implications. And I also would like to mention uh, the social license or trust issue, which is something which is a universal problem uh, for energy uh, suppliers, energy uh, generators around the world. Um, been working with the World Economic Forum for the past couple of years on exactly this issue. Uh, we produced uh, our uh, Global Futures Council on, uh, uh, on oil and gas. Uh, actually, I produced a paper looking at the trust issue recently, and I think it, uh, it speaks to a lot of the problems that, uh, that particular uh, petroleum oil and gas companies face in terms of dealing with uh, both the, uh, uh, the general public and, of course, with policymakers. In North America, um, we have seen, and I know that our, our panelists will talk about this, increasing cooperation and coordination between the three governments. You know, going back to the 2014 Toluca Summit, uh, we have uh, a really uh, a sort of uh, novel and, and very, very important uh, initiative to bring together the energy ministers or the energy ministries of the three countries. And I have to say that I am continually impressed by how far that has moved in such a short time. There's still a hell of a long way to go before we talk about tr truly integrated energy markets, but it is a remarkable departure, particularly when you place it against, as, as Laura intimated, um, when you place it against the failure to progress on many other North American issues, which seemed so much easier. Um, but you do have seen a coming together of personalities and of agencies in a very productive way. We see the similar issues, of course, in North America of uh, dealing with the, uh, the, the supply issue um, versus demand, and that applies to oil, gas, and, and electricity. Um, we're seeing lots of challenges in the sector to do with uh, you know, the employment question. A lot of people have, have lost their, their jobs over the past couple of years um, in, the, uh, in the sector. Um, we're looking at uh, mergers between companies, uh, the question of the price, social license, of course. I mean, some of the uh, the uh, the news that's been coming out of North Dakota recently has hit the headlines, and it brings put in stark uh, contrast once again uh, about how companies have a tough time actually negotiating with local communities and local stakeholders. 
uh, and of course the increasing use of technology. Uh, the Wilson Center, Mexico Institute, and Canada Institutes are working very, very hard on these issues, um, and that's why it's it's so important for us to uh, to have this event today. And it fits in very nicely, I think, with some of the work that we're doing with the State Department and with the Foreign Affairs Ministries of Canada and Mexico on looking at North American collaboration in general. We will hold a stakeholder meeting here at the Wilson Center uh, on the 29th of uh, of September, where we're hoping to bring together. Um, are many of the stakeholders looking at questions of competitiveness in North America and the energy uh, outlook for North America. And that's an ongoing process where we hope to get a broader public involved as well. Let me just very quickly uh, now introduce uh, uh, my, my good friends Sarah Ladislaw and Angelina LaRose. Sarah um, is Director and Senior Fellow of the Energy and National Security uh, Program at CSIS. As most of you know, she is a fixture here in Washington, and Sarah does an extraordinary job at CSIS. I think everybody is jealous of the work that CSIS does and her program does. I know that you're not, to, you would say you're, you're foolish to be jealous because I know how hard you work, <laughs> but it's extraordinary how much you, you, you put out there and, uh, and an incredible program you have. So thank you very much for being with us, Sarah. Angelina LaRose, uh, Office Director at the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Administration, thank you very much for being with us here today. Um, it is it is always good to hear from uh, the EIA uh, simply because you guys are so closely involved in actually pulling together the three governments uh, in their, uh, their co collaborative efforts um, and also putting out the information, the data, and the, uh, the, the heuristic tools that are necessary to begin to understand how North America works. So, Angelina, if I can ask you to, to kick us off today, I will end my blathering right there. And uh, thank you very much for being with us. Great. Might go to the podium. Please. So, uh, thank you for having me here today. It's an absolute, absolute pleasure. I'm going to be talking today about two different things. Uh, the first is EIA's involvement in the North American Cooperation for Energy Information, which is a, uh, one of the trilateral efforts the U U.S. government has entered into with uh, Canada and Mexico related in the energy space. I'm also going to go over some of the recent data we've seen, and which is affecting some of our forecasts and projections for the uh, three countries, which I'll also go over. So um, in December 2014, the energy ministers entered into an agreement to cooperate on uh, energy information. EIA was tasked to handle the U.S. Uh, part of that effort. Um, the effort itself involves four different things. Uh, there's an effort on energy trade statistics, uh, geographic energy information, mapping the infrastructure that all our countries have. Related to energy, uh, we have a, a, a group uh, devoted to the outlooks for energy supply and demand um, in, the, in the three countries, as well as the cross-reference for energy terminology. And this last um, part, this cross-reference for energy terminology, uh, is really the foundation for a lot of the other sections. So coming up with a common set of definitions, um, it, as well as producing these in the three official languages um, has really been uh, really one of the most important parts of this effort um, as well as one of the greatest challenges. You'll be surprised at how passionate people get when what is liquids, you know, well, I know what liquids <laughs> are, no, you don't know what liquids are, and it really is, you know, when we're trying to produce a common set of statistics or, and our outlooks and what do these mean, having this foundation has been critical. So in terms of what we've produced so far, um, a lot of activity happened in uh, last year in 2015. Um, in terms of the energy trade statistics, um, this effort related to um, consistent, producing consistent energy trade data across the jurisdictions, as well as um, delivering those to, to the public in uh, tables and graphs. Um, that can will be updated in regular intervals and will allow people to kind of compare um, the three countries' energy trade statistics. So one would expect, and this again goes back to kind of the method methodological and definitional, definitional challenges with this effort, 
that, okay, when, when we're looking at gas being exported from Canada into the United States, and what the U.S. is showing for gas being imported from Canada into, into the United States, it would be relatively the same. And what we've seen is we've had, um, there are differences. And, and again, a lot of these sometimes are um, differences related to, um, to, not necessarily with the natural gas for de definitionals, but just in terms of the methodology and how are we metering this. Um, but that being said, even within in countries, even comparing EIA data to U.S. Um, census data related to trade, there are differences as well as within Canada between um, StatsCan and NEB, there are also differences in trade data. So this is just a, a bridge that anybody who's working really with energy data um, have, has to cross. It's not necessarily unique to this trilateral effort. So one of the outcomes um, is this table. So we have produced a, t a glossary table um, in the three official languages of the country, and this is all online, um, and to try to, to serve as a foundation for a lot of the material that is coming out of this effort. Um, one of the main, uh, main aspects of this is where we don't agree is just to be very transparent where some of these differences may be born out of. So one of the kind of cooler things that we've produced is, is the mapping um, of ge the geographic energy information in North America. We have um, a dynamic map, which I'm showing in its full glory with all the layers um, shown, uh, where people can uh, basically customize uh, what they want to see, um, as well as we have five static maps that just um, have the infrastructure uh, in five different areas, such as uh, gas processing plants, um, power generators, et cetera. Um, one of the more interesting layers that you can actually see here, I put together this slide a few days ago, is we have a, a layer um, related to tropical storms and hurricanes. And I know this was so something that was great, of great interest to Mexico in particular while we were putting together this map is you can see um, in terms of the storm tracks, any infrastructure that it potentially could be uh, impacted by um, some of these more significant s storms. Um, each of these maps um, it, and on the website, um, the three countries have put together um, Excel and shape files uh, for these maps. And we're trying to be consistent um, with in terms of how, how we're designating things and the information behind it, um, such as capacity of these plants, et cetera. So um, we've also been a part of uh, trying to come up with energy projections across the three countries. Um, this is an effort I'm actually leading um, for this particular effort for the trilateral lateral agreement for the United States. Um, what we decided to do is in order to kind of maintain the integrity of each of our individual models is just to use a common set of assumptions um, between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Um, no one had the time, resources, or necessarily um, it, the inclination of the time to build a North American energy model. That wasn't really what we were trying to set out to do when we were putting together this outlook. What we were trying to do is to come up with a common set of assumptions. Most of these, uh, the assumptions in this effort um, from last year were assumptions we used in the annual energy outlook um, 2015, EIA's annual energy outlook, as well as some of the projections So for, um, that came out of that outlook. So for example, uh, one of the things we did is have with our diff uh, Canada and Mexico run like the Henry Hub price, our EIA's projection for the Henry Hub price through their energy models, as well as with our assumptions for oil price and, and different things like that to see how would that affect trade um, in particular if, um, because every each of those countries uh, within their modeling had different prices um, for Henry Hub. Um, Canada in particular had a very much lower Henry Hub price projection in their energy um, futures um, outlook than the EIA did. And I found this very interesting um, because using our, uh, for AO 2015, our higher Henry Hub price, Canada produced a lot of gas. And the way uh, Canada's modeling works 
is um, imports and exports are a, um, the difference between production and consumption. Uh, it's a residual. So uh, Canada really wanted to export a lot of gas using our Henry Hub um, price assumptions. Um, and there was also just very interesting findings uh, related to, to Mexico and where Mexico um, saw their imports in ex of U.S. gas going. Um, and it, it was, I think a lot of this effort, um, why I've enjoyed, and, and I think EIA as a whole has enjoyed being a part of the trilateral effort is we we're, we're really are dealing with our counterparts across the border who are working on very similar things and are kind of wrestling with the similar problems. You know, there are our brethren, you know, in, in energy data and uh, in forecast. So it's just been a really interesting learning opportunity trying to understand um, what everybody's doing across the border. Um, so some of the activities in 2016, um, a lot of these really just re relate to maintaining the dialogue um, that we, we uh, started in 2015. Um, as I mentioned, we, did, we do have uh, this information on our website. It's a, a, there's a website, it's nacei.org, uh, that EIA is built and hosted that has links to um, the different reports and uh, on the different enter uh, the different web pages for the countries. Um, we've had a lot of working groups. Um, we've had a lot of discussions about where do we want to go from here. Um, is this something where we want to run uh, you know, for the outlook? Um, for example, uh, last year we ran uh, the reference case assumptions. Do we want to start looking at how would side cases be impacted if we ran each of our models using similar assumptions? Um, we're working, still working through some definitional issues, um, trying to understand our energy statistics. Uh, one of the things, so in terms of next step that we're EIAs, particularly interested in engaging our um, Mexican and Canadian counterparts on our um, having their electric grid operators participate in our hourly electric operating data platform. So EIA recently launched for the U.S. Uh, balancing authorities. Um, this hourly um, is, is our first hourly survey. So we're, we're getting finer and finer granularity in what we're producing. Um, so we have this map that basically shows electric demand um, across uh, the United States from the grid operators. And we're really uh, encouraging, and, and both Mexico and Canada have um, expressed some interest in participating in this so we could um, look at this more holistically as a North American uh, energy region. Um, there are some challenges um, with that, particularly concerning Canada because of um, the different provincial, uh, you know, we're dealing not only at a, at a federal level with Canada, there's also, um, as it goes with electricity, a lot of provincial um, input that is needed. Uh, it's a little easier with Mexico because they only have one grid operator. But that is a, a, an aspiration <laughs> for us to, uh, to add them to, to this, uh, this product. So just taking a look at um, why, uh, why this is in growing as an important issue. This is just showing, a, it's a map showing trade of petroleum, electricity, and natural gas. Uh, petroleum and natural gas data are for 2015, and electricity is for 2013. Um, we have much more of an interconnect um, in the electricity market with Canada than we do with uh, Mexico. Right now, uh, largely our main tie with Mexico is the Baja Peninsula, where we get a lot of, um, uh, we have more imports from Canada coming in um, for electricity. Uh, Canada and Mexico make up about half of um, in the first half of 2016, made up about half of our uh, oil imports. Um, so they are a very significant trading partner for the United States. And about 2 million barrels per day of petroleum products are exchanged between North America every day. So it's, they're significant energy trading partners for us. In terms of natural gas, with increase in natural gas production in the United States, um, we do have declining imports from Canada, but our exports to Mexico are um, certainly increasing. And in, in fact, uh, reached a record high of three and a half BCF per day in June. 
And so, um, you know, all this trade is possible because uh, infrastructure does not stop at the borders. Um, and this is particularly true when we're thinking of um, natural gas trade to Mexico. Um, there's, and this, what this map shows is the darker lines are showing um, planned projects. This is vintage uh, January uh, of this year. So it hasn't been updated in, in about a half a year. Um, but there's been a lot of projects trying to increase the capacity of natural gas imports um, from the United States to Mexico. And this, uh, these issues isn't, isn't just about building these cross-country, cross-border connections. There's also a lot of effort um, but for Canada to build out their, uh, their transportation um, pipes um, so they have are able to move this uh, relatively inexpensive U.S. gas to the power plants, et cetera. Uh, one of the interesting things, thinking of North America collectively, is there has been uh, investment, um, there's investment in, from Canadian companies like TransCanada and Mexico Pipelines. Um, and so it's a real, uh, there's a lot of interregional operation of, uh, of this type of infrastructure. And in fact, um, I think Trans according to TransCanada, they've spent about $5 billion um, investing in Mexican pipelines. So just taking a look at some of our projections, uh, what, what this, these graphs, um, I have a couple of these types of graphs that you're going to see. Uh, what they're showing is um, our information from our annual energy outlook 2016 for the United States. Um, that was released in June. And then we have um, for Canada and Mexico, we have information from our international energy outlook um, from 2016 as well on these graphs. Um, in terms of uh, Mexico, uh, we have uh, Mexico tied with Chile as a, in our international energy outlook because our OECD countries, um, we've separated them out by just sharing out their, uh, their current shares of these different things and pr putting that forward just to try to break Chile out of out of this picture. Um, so this is showing uh, North American natural gas. Um, consumption is on the left bars, production is on the right. A lot of, a lot of what we're seeing is just, um, we're seeing growth in exports um, in the, the North America as a whole becoming an exporter by 2020. And a lot of this is driven by the development of shale resources, particularly in the United States. In the U.S., in our projections, we have shale contributing um, to an ever-growing uh, production picture. We have upward uh, production uh, throughout the projection period through 2040, and we have shale contributing about 50, over 50 percent right now, a little over 50 percent, but by 2040 contributing to about 70 percent of um, U.S. production levels. Um, there's only four countries right now that have commercial shale um, production. Um, Canada is one of them. And so they've been producing shale since about 2008, or producing from shale resources. And it's ex we're expecting um, and projecting that that contribution to their overall production will reach about 30% by 2040. Um, we're sh showing somewhat of a delay in Mexico um, producing from their shale resources, particularly as they have a lot of cheap or uh, relatively inexpensive uh, gas across the border that they can import and they can focus on the development of their oil resources. Um, but we do have them producing after 2030 and at commercial levels in their shale basins. Um, and looking at consumption uh, in the U.S., uh, we have uh, natural gas consumption increasing across um, the economy with exceptions in residential um, applications, just, and this is largely due to population migrations as well as the energy efficiency me measures. And we also um, are showing expanded use of natural gas in Mexico, and this is being driven um, largely through their electric power um, consumption of gas. So there is results I sh showed you are from our reference case. So what this graph is showing is um, just the, this is from the annual energy outlook. So looking at the U.S. imports and exports of natural gas, and US, the U.S. does remain an importer and an exporter of natural gas throughout our projection period. Um, I know there's a lot of interest in our LNG exports and our projections for LNG exports, but we definitely have um, exports growing 
um, but leveling off to, to Mexico as well as um, to Canada. But we, that said, even with this uh, increase in production, we are still reliant on Canada, Canadian imports throughout our production period to be a marginal supply source. Um, the, just to show you, when, when people interpret EIA's projections, and this is something we try to really kind of hammer home to people, because every once in a while people will be like, oh, in, in 2033, your gas price is this. And we're like, no, like look at the trends. And even more important than looking at the trends when you're looking at a long-term projection is comparing um, the different side cases against the reference case. So EIA's reference case is current laws and regulations, but we run a lot of, because of the level of uncertainty um, when you're doing a 25-year projection of energy market, um, we have a lot of different side cases, and you can kind of see the impact of different the different side cases right here. We have a, the middle graph shows our high oil and gas resource case. So this is expecting 50% more estimated ultimate recover recovery from um, shale wells, and you can see in that that it really brings down the domestic gas price. And with this lower domestic gas price, in particular with LNG, it makes it a lot more economic for us to export a lot of LNG. And so that's you know, that's, it's not quite twice as much LNG as in our reference case, but it is considerably higher. And this is in contrast to our low oil price, where in our low oil price, we have seven, by the end of the projection period, we have got oil prices, world oil prices, um, remaining at about uh, $70 a barrel. And you can see that also affects um, the economics, particularly of LNG. So just taking a look at liquid fuels production, um, it, within our IO, Mexico and Chile were the only OECD regions that had growth in liquids consumption, and this was largely born out of increases in the transportation sector. So you can see some growth in uh, Mexican liquids uh, fuel consumption. Um, we have, in terms of production, we have tight oil uh, growing after it, it has dipped down in, in the U.S. a bit, but we have that rebounding somewhat through the projection period. We have a lot of increased um, Gulf of Mexico pro production from projects, as well as continued, um, continued production from Canadian oil sands. And so this is my last slide, and this is just taking a look at electricity. Um, Canada, Mexico, and the United States uh, recently enter, entered to, into an agreement where there's a goal of having 50% of electricity generation from clean energy sources by the year 2025. This um, agreement or this goal uh, came out after, uh, after we were done modeling our IO 2016 and as well as our domestic um, annual energy outlook 2016. But we took a look to see, well, even without kind of explicitly modeling this, how, how would the countries, um, you know, how, how, what are we showing the level of um, clean energy sources? And in, in this application, clean energy sources is considered uh, renewables as well as nuclear. So these are low, low no emitting sources of um, greenhouse gases. So in 2015, about 38% of North America's um, electricity mix was from these uh, clean energy sources. And by 2025, within our modeling, we had about 45% of um, electricity being generated from clean energy sources. So um, clearly, the United States is the largest consumer, as you can see uh, on this graph of electric generation or electricity uh, within North America. We are, represent a little over 80% um, in 2015. Um, but one of the things to kind of even look at even evaluating, well, okay, well, we are five percentage points lower than, than the actual goal is the goal also included energy efficiency measures, um, which you can't really pull out of um, these percentages of these shares um, because we, within our modeling, we are showing energy efficiency gains. Um, Canada uh, by far has, uh, is at a, has hired a generation from these clean sources currently and into the future. And this is largely, largely because of their hydro resources 
um, but they are currently only representing about 13% of total generation. So that is what I have. I've included some links as well. So. Thank you, Angelina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angelina. You've given uh, at least me plenty of food for thought here. I have a couple of pages of notes uh, for questions later on. Um, Sarah, over to you. Would you like to use the podium? Would you like to stay here? I'll stay right here if that's okay. Yeah. Absolutely. I, if I stand at a podium, I talk for too long. So um, <laughs> thank you very much for having me. And uh, I just want to congratulate the Wilson Center and Laura and Duncan for your uh, all constant uh, focus on issues in Mexico and Canada. You know, we at CSIS uh, have a standing rule of any time we talk about U.S. energy policy, we try to think about what the relationship is to Canada and Mexico because we think it's a really important part of the energy system. But we wouldn't be able to do that if, if it weren't for groups like you that were consistently focusing on them in greater de detail. So I congratulate you for doing that. Uh, and then I'd also be really remiss not to talk about one of my favorite government agencies, uh, the EIA. Angela, Angelina, this great presentation. You said a lot of things that, that I won't need to say, but I just uh, I can't emphasize enough how important EIA data is to the policymaking process, to the private sector investment process. I, EIA data, without it, we would all be lost, and you guys have done a phenomenal job adding to uh, the detail, not only the hourly electricity pricing, but uh, your drilling reports and all of the things that you guys do is just really, really remarkable. We'd all be lost without it. So. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different than what Angelina did, which is sort of talk about what I think the future strategic direction of North American energy cooperation can and should be. And um, the reason I do this is I sort of started my career at the Department of Energy working on North American energy cooperation. And uh, at the time, uh, it was an entirely different environment. Uh, the uh, tension around uh, recently concluded NAFTA negotiations included some sensitivity around not talking about policy. We could talk about anything else. We could talk about science and technology. We could talk about regulation, especially after things like the 2003 electricity blackout. So there were some interesting innovations, but you really weren't allowed to talk about policy, especially uh, remember once holding a very controversial uh, roundtable in Mexico where we talked about oil. Uh, and that was just amazing. We weren't supposed to be doing that, but we did. We were so brave. Uh, and, uh, and spending a lot of time in Alberta working on how to get that oil sands down to the United States because it was a pressing government priority. So times have changed, uh, and but in very, very interesting ways. And I think that they, uh, they will get more interesting going forward regardless of the political outcome here in the United States. Um, and I think part of that is because each country has experienced uh, real and substantive changes, not only in uh, its uh, supply and demand balance, not that they've flipped, but they're certainly heading in different directions than they were uh, a decade ago, um, but also in their overarching uh, policy priorities. Uh, and I think that that presents all, all three countries with real uh, and remarkable uh, opportunities and challenges. On the opportunity side of the equation, I think that you cannot underestimate what the three uh, uh, executive sort of administrations are doing uh, in North America right now uh, to run through this window in the post-Paris environment of really trying to do what the post-Paris environment is designed to do, which is raise ambition on climate action. Uh, you have uh, uh, three, uh, three countries that uh, now have uh, open investment environments and political willingness, uh, at least within some parts of the government, uh, to, uh, to, to really make progress on the things that will enable them to uh, raise ambition and reduce emissions in the North American energy sector. Uh, I think the, the slide you showed, Angelina, was a perfect example. Uh, not only, you know, uh, did did the pre-announcement uh, um, estimation of uh, the r the role that clean energy can play in the in the North American energy system look to be about 45 percent, right? Which you could you could I think we spent a lot of time trying to say, oh well, we, we uh, can we actually reach those goals? Some of these goals are designed to push us a little bit, uh, and I think that that was certainly one of them. I think 40 to 45 percent methane emissions uh, from the oil and gas sector, another trilateral agreement. Uh, is something that is reachable, but in a low oil price environment doesn't come without a good deal of hand-wringing and, uh, and political maneuvering and regulatory maneuvering and a lot of work on the oil and gas sector side. So I, I think that that, too, is a, a laudable and, uh, and also a sort of a, a stretch goal uh, 
uh, as well, in addition to the remarkable amount of work that has gone into greenhouse gas uh, and uh, efficiency in the vehicle sector, all the different sectors that we're working on efficiency in all three countries, um, huge amounts of work that's going on there, and a lot of data that's needed to underpin both the policies uh, um, that, that support those efforts and the analysis that goes into seeing whether we're meeting them in a cost-effective way. So I think that we've, in the last even, you know, sort of year, had a huge surge in North American energy cooperation towards this effort of, uh, of decarbonization, and I think, that that's, uh, I think that that's making a lot of progress. Um, I think that we probably uh, have a lot of challenges uh, uh, for the North American energy landscape as well, um, one of which being low, a low oil price environment. Um, a low oil price environment uh, is not only uh, uh, is not necessarily a problem, uh, but it certainly does uh, change the forward trajectory of uh, oil and gas production, both in the United States, certainly uh, in Canada, and definitely in Mexico. It's trying to attract additional investment uh, uh, in uh, real and incremental ways uh, uh, for uh, for their um, uh, oil sector. Um, it's not to say that it's a surprise. Oil markets go through cycles, yet every time we reach either the height or the low of an oil cycle, we ask questions, is it structural, is it cyclical, what is it going to look like going forward? And we have to make real decisions about how to ensure that we have a resilient um, uh, oil and gas sector going forward and we make the right decisions and investments, not only about upstream questions but midstream questions. Um, that brings me to a second challenge. Uh, we did a report uh, about a year ago uh, focusing on North American midstream infrastructure, um, partially because we were a little concerned. We were hearing a lot of hyperbolic conversation about the North American energy superpower that we were becoming, and it was largely predicated on uh, supply. Uh, supply is all well and good, but if you can't get it where it needs to go, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so we wanted to focus on all the ways in which the changing midstream infrastructure in the United States was a real um, uh, factor in the calculus of whether or not we're actually going to pre be producing and moving these resources to where they need to be. That's not an advocacy statement, but it was certainly uh, us trying to point out uh, something that, uh, that was really important for us to recognize that this infrastructure matters. Uh, in order to be able to realize all of the benefits that come from those resources. I think we're still grappling with those issues today, and I think that um, uh, we've got some real examples about how it seems to be incumbent both on governments and on companies uh, today throughout North America um, to be rethinking what it means to earn that social license to build that infrastructure. I think that's going to be a huge theme, uh, especially as we go through uh, a period where at least in a North America, excuse me, in a United States political context, we have two uh, people who would like to be president of the United States, both with major infrastructure plans. Uh, and that infrastructure will matter in a cross-border sense, it will matter in a domestic sense, and it really will matter in terms of uh, being able to build that infrastructure, so we're going to need to focus on that uh, a great deal. Um, I think the last two things that I would focus on, one, are, uh, are the low growth environment. Um, we are spending a lot of time uh, at the, the energy program that I run, uh, tries really hard to uh, match uh, policy proclivity with market reality, with technological uncertainty. Uh, and, uh, and, and one of the things we think is getting really severely discounted in most of the sort of political outlooks for not only, you know, North America, uh, in the United States, uh, but certainly uh, uh, the world, uh, is the fact that we seem to still be in a, a sluggish and low growth recovery environment uh, heading into the potential for a cyclical recession. Uh, low growth is hard uh, for changing the energy system, and if you think decarbonization is going to be a big goal, you got to change out infrastructure, and growth is a much more helpful environment for doing that than sluggish, uh, than sluggish growth. So. Uh, so we're thinking, I think that's something that North American uh, uh, strategic focus uh, should, should be looking at is what kind of growth environment do we expect to see and how do we seed uh, future growth. And then I would say the final thing, oh, and by the way, labor. Uh, I think your point about labor, Duncan, is very well placed. Every, every um, uh, each, each uh, of our countries, the United States, Canada, and Mexico are dealing with uh, human resource capacity issues, labor issues in an energy transition in North America that will be very, very important and difficult to deal with. Um, and then the final thing I'd say is that we have historically struggled as a continent with political continuity on our energy issues. 
Um, it's not just a U.S. issue. It is certainly uh, an issue that we have uh, in all uh, three countries. Uh, and it's not to say, you know, we hope to there's a magic wand we can wave and there will be political continuity across the board. But I do think what it does point to is another really important aspect uh, that has always carried the day in North American energy cooperation, which is to not only focus on uh, what's happening at the national level, but regional, sub-regional, city, uh, uh, cross-border cooperation is really, really important for keeping momentum and continuity going in the relationship. And I think that um, you're seeing that, you know, with um, uh, a lot of cooperative efforts uh, across the board now. Uh, and I think that's a really, really positive sign for the uh, the relationships uh, in general and its ability to continue regardless of what the political outcomes might be going forward. So I'm going to stop there. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Lots and lots of food for thought. We have about uh, 20 minutes before we, uh, we have our next panel. And so I'd like to kick off with, uh, um, with, a, with a question for each of you. And it is on um, the aspect of the sort of the clean energy uh, outlook, you know, announced in Ottawa. Um, how, how doable is it in both of your opinions? I mean, you mentioned that it may well be a target that is set out there, and targets can be very useful. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're at least 5% away from that, according to the, uh, the reference case. Um, what needs to happen in order to get us to that 50% um, goal of, from clean energy? Angelina. OK. <laughs> um, I guess, and, and I mean, as you know, EIA doesn't necessarily comment on policy, um, but in terms of uh, us showing that we're 5% um, away, even without explicitly trying to, to model that, um, is in not taking, also not taking into consideration some of the energy efficiency gains, which may add a couple percentages um, to, that, to that mix. Um, I think th we're seeing increasing, um, you know, particularly from from Mexico, we're seeing in increasing um, commitment to to greener energy. Um, we definitely in, within the United States um, have the Clean Power Plan mm -hmm. that's coming into effect for twenty from twenty uh, starting in twenty twenty two. That's assisting assisting those efforts and. Um, I guess in terms of what will get us by 2025, that extra 5%, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure because I think we're doing a lot of, um, domestically, we're doing a lot of things already. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a, a lot of retirements of coal, coal plants. And again, the Clean Power Plan can't, is, is a very significant piece of, of legislation in this country. Um, and we are seeing movement, uh, you know, in Mexico, more towards that, and and we have retirement in Canada. So yeah, I mean, I guess yeah, that extra five percent is is a challenge, mm -hmm. you know, because we're already undertaking across between all three countries under undertaking a lot of effort to to move in that direction. Um, so I I'm not quite sure how to kind of get the ball over the line, um, other than trying trying to do more of the same, you know, or yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, I agree with everything Angelina just said. I do think, though, that there's, there's probably two ways of looking at it, right? So if you just take the United States uh, in and of itself, we have a Paris climate agreement, you know, and our target is 20, uh, 26, 28 percent below uh, 2005 levels by, uh, by 2025. I've never I've never seen an estimate that quite gets us at that uh, at that level mm -hmm. uh, um, in that time frame without additional effort at the state and local level. I think that there's a there's a couple things. I mean, uh, it does require ad additional effort. Um, it does require um, some of the policies that you're seeing at a subnational level. I think when you look at the ways in which people are looking at additional regulatory processes or additional um, incentive-based mandates to get states and cities to act in more aggressive ways, whether they come from the federal government or they come from the state and local level, I think that'll play a large role in trying to add up additional increments to be able to get to that target. Um, I do think that uh, there's also another side of this, which is um, there's a lot of techno-economic optimism about the changes in the electric power sector. Uh, when you look at DER, distributed energy resource penetration rates, right. 
the EIA's numbers versus some other groups' numbers, they're pretty wide. Uh, they don't get you a 5% increment, but they do show that there's some real uncertainty about uh, what those penetration rates will be. And, and we're not great at actually incorporating them into how we calculate some of these things. So I think over that time frame, um, small things will matter quite a bit. We do have to be careful, and I'm not a, 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 a fairly fuel agnostic, um, but, but we do have a danger to meeting targets like that, which is the retirement of nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it will be hard to make up those increments if you're losing ground as you're trying to make ground on this uh, on this target. So there's a lot of stuff to be dealt with. But I think I, by design, I think it was meant to be a bit of a stretch goal as well. Do you think that we have actually turned a corner in the conversation? Have we? Are we seeing a paradigm shift? Is the uh, if you look at this in historical terms? It used to be a battle just to get people to talk about the issue. Now we talk about the issue. There's a general consensus that something needs to be done. Governments have made significant steps, uh, taken significant steps forward individually and now collectively. Is this a, a, a ball or a snowball that is going to keep rolling and getting bigger and bigger in the sense that, well, now we've, we've, we've sort of embarked upon this journey, we may as well continue down the road and we may as well add to it. Is that what you see is happening? You're talking about climate change yeah. in general? Do you want to say anything? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so turned a corner would be, uh, would be probably a little more optimistic than I would put it. I think that um, I think there is – when you look back, you know, eight years ago, right, there was arguably in the U.S. context a lot more agreement uh, about policies that we could put in place to deal with this challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what's happened in the intervening period of time is that you certainly have a lot more places that are enacting policies, and you have a lot more policies that are more aggressive, and you have vastly more global participation in the issue. So there's a huge amount of uh, of, of emphasis and uh, energy that is uh, in the decarbonization, uh, low carbon energy space. I do think, though, that some of the tactics for delivering on that have, uh, in partially in the U.S. and uh, um, ha have have been s sort of problematic for building consensus. Right, there is an argument in the United States about whether too much of our climate policy exists in regulation and not through legislative efforts, and I think that that reflects. Uh, the lack of a broad political consensus about how to tackle this challenge. I don't want to say that that means we, we don't have a durable commitment to doing something about the challenge, but I think what when you look at w what is required to um, really reduce emissions between now and 2030, they're very difficult goals, but they're very doable things should we have the right policy investments in place. When you look at what's required after 2030 to reach deep decarbonization, mm -hmm. those are fairly serious changes. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that to say we've turned the corner is to not really recognize what's going to be required uh, a couple decades out. And so I, I do think that there is vastly more momentum and activity going on in the area of, uh, of decarbonization. And, and quite frankly, I think some of it is um, – a lot of it has to do with policy, but a lot of it also has to do with technology and consumer choice, especially in the electric power sector. So um, uh, I, I do think that um, one of the ways that perhaps we've turned the corner, and I promise I'll be quiet, um, is uh, I, I was uh, always thought it was funny that uh, the electric power sector, folks thought it would take 25, 30 percent penetration renewable energy to really cause utilities to say, geez, we've got to do something different, right? We're nowhere near that, mm -hmm. and utilities understand they have to do something different. So I think in a business model investment perspective, the change actually happened much more quickly. And and that's a really durable part of, uh, of, of the low carbon story, which is that businesses now largely view their competitive future as incorporating some sort of climate policy um, uh, going forward. How serious that is, pace and scale and timing, I think that's all still up for grabs, but but certainly that it's a reality and likely here to stay is, uh, is certainly the corner I guess we've turned. Great, thank you. I'd like to take some questions from the audience if I can. I'll take uh, three in the opening round. Maybe I'm being ambitious, maybe I'm a dreamer. <laughs> Call me a fool, but uh, if you have any uh, doubts, uh, or questions on your mind, please raise your hand. There's a microphone going around. Nobody has any questions. Remarkable thing. There's one person at the back there. There's one person up here. Thank you very much. 
And I assume there'll be somebody on the right hand of uh, side of the audience as well. <laughs> uh, Peter Hemp from the State Department. Uh, you Peter. discussed um, uh, the achievability of the clean energy goal. How about the methane goal? Okay, great. And at the back here. And again, if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself. Uh, thank you very much for these um, great presentations. My name is Daniela Stevens from American University, a PhD student. I'd like to ask what you think uh, the role of carbon trading is um, individually in each country and also subnationally, uh, but also what the, um, the likelihood of, of a North American carbon market you think is for the near future. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, a third question going once. If not, I will ask a question. Okay, um, I'm going to add in one, and this one is specifically for you, Angelina. Um, the the process and the uh, the, the way of of, uh, of working together amongst the North American nations, it's uh, it, it seems to me to be kind of unique. Is there anywhere else in the world where you see this kind of process going on of basically bringing together um, the 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 data, the information, trying to create common understandings? In a sense, in essence, trying to create an epistemic community between. Uh, the, the three countries of North America. Is there something similar, for example, in the European Union, or is this actually truly unique? I think there's a, there's a lot of efforts going on. It's not entirely unique. Um, I think there is an effort uh, among within the EU. Um, I'm not sure necessarily how formal like the the these types of agreements are. I know uh, one of the interesting things. Um, so I've started my my new role at EIA um, in, in March. And so I, a part of what my office does is the international energy analysis for EIA. And one of the most uh, kind of remarkable things I wasn't anticipating with, with my, my job is how many countries are interested as well as teaming up with EIA for a very similar type of um, agreement that we have uh, with with Mexico and Canada in terms of sharing um, our methodologies for for our energy statistics as well as our approach to modeling. And even within EIA, we have uh, relationships or are entering, entering relationships or are being courted by um, different countries such as India, um, such as um, you know countries in South America. And I really, uh, think there's there is a community out there and I think there's a, there's a recognition of and I'm not I'm, I'm I work for an unbiased agency so I'm not trying to sound biased but I think the work EIA does is is very important having having this this um, way to produce uh, independent statistics and analysis that can be used um, you know for, from both sides of the aisle and I think there's a recognition about that um, so ye yes, you do see there is definitely a community of people that produce energy statistics and energy models and, and uh, trying to understand that uh, within the, the EU and trying to produce more um, transparent statistics. And, and I think one of the interesting things about what we're seeing here is that what the work that you guys do with your counterparts in Canada and Mexico is just one dimension of the increasing cooperation. I mean, the fact that we have... Uh, Mexican Canadian regulators meeting with U.S. counterparts, meeting with each other on a regular basis, also helps to form that uh, that socialization process, which I see going on. I mean, I, I don't recall a time in the past, even under the um, the North American Energy Working Group days, when you had such intense interaction on a regular basis between regulators and policymakers. I mean, there's a constant conversation, it seems, going on. And a lot of the recent conversations, and we'll talk about this a, bit, a little bit more on the, on the Mexico panel, have been directed in sort of helping Mexico uh, as it moves through its energy transition, energy policy transition. But all of that builds ties and links which are actually going to be very, very important in the future. Sarah, do you want to come in on uh, either that question or some of the, uh, the questions on methane or carbon trading? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, and, and just on that question, I mean, I do think that the amount of constant attention and care and feeding it requires to be able to make those data linkages and not just make the data linkages, but actually make them impactful and not that this is your goal, but policy relevant, right, is 
is uh, is something that is tried to be replicated elsewhere around the world, but doesn't always succeed. And so I think that you guys are to be given a lot of credit for doing that. On the methane challenge, so I tend to think the methane challenge is um, uh, certainly achievable. Um, what the consequences of achieving it would be on small producers uh, might, I think, warrants a little bit of attention. Um, it's another one of those areas where I'm worried about the data. Uh, I think that um, we're putting in place some policies uh, and some objectives that can likely be measured and verified and met by some people, uh, but not by all people, and we're trying to do that quickly. So that's hard, uh, and I think that um, there's a lot of concern in industry that that's happening too fast and that we're going to learn things as we get better measurements of methane that it's going to uh, cause us to question whether those goals were a good idea or a bad idea, fast or slow. But I also think that there's a real imperative when you put this in the kind of global climate change context to understand that if you'd like to be using more gas, then you got to deal with the methane issue if you want it to be climate relevant. So there's a real, I think that the trilateral uh, uh, folks should be, the people who put together these um, agreements, should be really credited for putting it in there because I do think that um, you need to focus on it. I think it's an area for ample uh, discussion and uh, in real government uh, and private sector work. So I think that it's, a, it, uh, it's helpful in that way. Um, on the carbon trading side, I get this is uh, probably one of the top five most popular questions uh, out there these days. I think that carbon trading in North America is very important for probably uh, three different reasons. Um, the first is that the carbon trading, carbon pricing enterprise globally is at an interesting inflection point. Uh, it is included in the Paris Climate Agreement, whether or not it is a um, uh, effective mechanism going forward for reducing emissions uh, that is existing and growing and linking across borders is a very politically relevant thing for a lot of people who play in the international climate negotiations. Um, whether whether uh, cap and trade, I'll just stick with cap and trade for a second, is actually an effective means of reducing emissions uh, and how we perfect that tool, I think, is a very live question if you watch what's happening in Reggie and what's happening in uh, the Canadian uh, systems and what's happening in California. Um, the, you know, the question of how to make sure that that's really effective, how you incorporate it with your other complementary policies, I think is something that you know, we still need to be talking a lot about because um, we need to sort of understand you know, how to improve uh, those programs going forward. And the third is uh, the, the aspect that we get asked the most about is whether or not there'll be a North American carbon market in some way, shape, or form at some point in time. And this usually gets linked with the question about whether the U.S. is going to institute a carbon tax. Um, why is this probably the most important, interesting question? Um, I think it's because people are trying to make it um, lead to a North American carbon price. Uh, I think that this is not just sort of like one of those innocent questions that people ask because they're curious. I think that there is uh, money and intellect I involved and political uh, uh, stuff involved in actually trying to make that true. Uh, and so that's always interesting. Um, so if you don't think you're going to get a carbon tax in the United States for X, Y, and Z reasons, uh, or you think that there might be um, uh, a less than ambition carbon price across, uh, across Canada, Right? How do you use subnational elements to drive progress on those issues, um, uh, and how do you triangulate on that? And I think that that's exactly what's going on. I think Mexico has added a huge amount of uh, uh, of inertia to that discussion because it's not just a sort of traditional Canada-U.S. Uh, conversation about California and a, and, and, and a couple of provinces. Um, but it is about the, the potential for this to happen North America-wide. So I think that triangulation is going to keep happening, uh, and I think that, that will drive additional policy conversations uh, and, and probably is, is the, the best place to make progress on these issues going forward. Great. Uh, any other questions? We have about five minutes left. There's a question at the back here. Andrea? Thank you. Andrea Tanko from the Mexico Institute. Um, I was just wondering how much today of electricity generation comes from energy sources, from clean energy sources um, in North America. That's uh, in 2015. It was about 38 percent. 
came from what's uh, been termed as clean energy, so it's renewables and nuclear. Okay, great. Um, I have a question to close up with, and it's uh, it's a big question, but I want a short answer. Okay, the three <laughs> <Those> factors, <laughs> the three <laughs> global trends. Now, for each of you, the three global trends that you see as being most important in shaping the future of energy markets in the next ten years here in North America. I can hear the brains ticking over. <laughs> Do you want to go first? Do you want to go first? You go first. Okay. I mean, I think climate. I mean, climate policy is definitely mm -hmm. a significant one, and and in North America is, um, I think, in particular, uh, the develop how the Mexico reforms, you know, actually. The progress they're making on those, and and the, and, and particularly with partnering uh, with um, non-Mexican firms to, to develop their resources, and whether they can replicate some of the success uh, in producing you know, what we don't like to say at EIA, but, but unconventional resources. Um, those are two. Uh, <laughs> Two really large ones, I think, really? you know. We can come um, back to you for the third okay. if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Sarah. Um, so it's a great question. Uh, uh, economic growth. Uh, I think economic growth, economic growth, economic growth, only because the increments make such a big difference in the overall numbers, right? And, and it, it um, drives investment, a whole bunch of things. So I think, I think economic growth is the top one. I think climate policy is certainly the second one because um, not – I, I don't mean to be glib about it, but like we're either going to do this or we're not, and uh, and somewhere over the next you know ten years uh, we'll under we're either going to get way more serious about this or something's going to get easier or something or or it's going to stop being an issue in the same way that it's an issue right now. Not to mean it's going to go away, but it's just going to change uh, a bit. Um, uh, and I guess this uh, the 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 third one would be. Um, I, honestly, I think it's the cost profile for unconventionals. I mean, when you look at, I, I think investment in Canada and uh, in Mexico are really, really, really important from an upstream oil and gas perspective. But the thing that sort of came like a tidal wave through the continent was shale gas and tight oil production in the United States. And when you look at the uncertainty in the oil and uh, oil price and technology scenario, there's one gigantic wedge up there, and that really is production of unconventionals. I think it determines which direction our infrastructure is flowing in. I mean, and that's not to say you can't see the same things happening in Canada and Mexico, but it's certainly the one that's out there right now. It's the just, you know, what what is that production going to look like going forward and what cost threshold? Great. And I, I have my third one. <laughs> <laughs> You're just I in time. I because I, I, I quite, uh, I definitely agree with the economic growth, but also what the oil price environment, whether yeah. I know you referenced the low oil and price environment, and I've been to um, conferences where people have also talked about, well, is this, is this just the environment? Is this just the, the price of oil um, for a long time? And I think that will definitely drive a lot of decisions, and it relates back to the cost of developing these resources as well. Yeah. Right. And, and you can make your predictions on that oil price later on when you can actually charge for that, okay? I won't make you say it in public. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Angelina and Sarah. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you very much. We are now going to move straight on in our, uh, in our program. We are delighted to have with us um, Mexican Undersecretary for, for Energy, uh, for Electricity, sorry, um, Cesar Hernandez Ochoa. Uh, Cesar is, uh, is a very good friend of the Wilson Center, has worked with us uh, closely over the years. Uh, we're delighted to, to have you here, um, Under Secretary. Um, thank you very much for, for taking the time. I'd also like to mention that uh, uh, Cesar Hernandez is uh, one of those unique uh, government uh, 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 officials who has a very strong intellectual background in the think tank world, in academia. He actually wrote a very, very, very good book about reforming the electricity se sector in Mexico before he had to actually then come forward and apply those ideas. So I'd be interested in hearing actually how your ideas on paper worked out in practice. Um, 
But uh, I think that one of the things that we focused on far too often here in, in Washington is perhaps the oil and gas sector, and we've neglected the electricity sector. We were lucky enough last year to have you, Cesar, with us here to talk about that. We'd very much appreciate you coming up and giving us an update on how the electricity reform is going, and most importantly, how that market is shaping up, because now we actually do have the beginnings of a real market for electricity in Mexico. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Cesar Hernandez Ochoa. Thank you very much. And uh, I thank Duncan Wood, who is an, a very old friend and uh, a good friend at that. Uh, for the opportunity to speak to you about uh, the new electricity sector in Mexico. Uh, what would be a good time to... We have uh, uh -huh. about half an hour in total, including questions. Excellent. So I'll give a 20-minute presentation. And Perfect. Excellent. So this is uh, the presentation I have with me is uh, basically to give you a very uh, uh, overview of the whole package of reforms in the electricity sector that we have conducted in the last... It's two years now since we passed the secondary legislation, uh, a little under three years uh, since we passed the constitutional amendment. And probably the, the key point to, to underline uh, to start this conversation would be to say that it is a reform that has been implemented quite uh, with a sense of urgency, with a, an idea that we had to get uh, some of these reforms in place and working before the end of the administration. And we had been lucky, uh, very lucky at that, at having uh, the first and the most difficult political part, uh, at least uh, in regards to Congress and to some of the large political actors in Mexico, to have that passed in the first two years of the administration. So uh, uh, we passed the constitutional amendment in December 2013, uh, barely a year after the Peña Nieto administration started, and we had uh, the secondary legislation, a set of new, nine new laws and uh, reforms to other 12 laws uh, passed in uh, a period of nine months after the constitutional amendment had been, uh, had been approved. So, uh, in fact, we ha had been able to start uh, very early in the administration. We had the four years to implement it, and we're halfway now. And what I will show you is basically well, it looks like uh, two, uh, halfway before the administration ends, and I think we have accomplished a set of milestones. This is a particularly interesting day for uh, electricity in Mexico because in a couple of hours we will uh, start uh, the process of examining all the economic offers which were presented yesterday for our second uh, uh, electricity auction where we auction long-term contracts for uh, clean electricity and for capacity for the first time in Mexico, and uh, uh, we were we presented yesterday in a press conference uh, what the level of participation was, what the level of offers we had been received was, and we're very uh, uh, happy because all the signs until now, uh, and we'll see in two hours, but all the signs point uh, to, uh, towards uh, we having a very successful second auction in Mexico with good prices, good levels of participation, and for the first time, with the element of capacity being auctioned and awarded, hopefully, uh, as it was in the first auction, at record, uh, world record breaking prices. So we'll see. But anyway, so uh, the presentation starts. Um, I am the one who can uh, basically uh, the structure of the of the presentation goes starts by the end by saying what the impact we uh, hope to achieve we estimate will be what we try to achieve, how the industry structure looks, and some of the elements of uh, the new market, the electricity market in Mexico, and some of the actions we're taking for developing infrastructure. And so uh, uh, this is a map that was taken from uh, an international energy agency paper uh, uh, some months ago published, and it uh, looks at the world in terms, uh, at the map of the world in terms of which countries and which regions have markets and which one and which regions do not have markets, and what type of markets they have. And so uh, the important thing to highlight here is that Mexico didn't look blue uh, a couple of years ago. It looked more like gray or light uh, brown. And it now looks, uh, in terms of industry structure, 
as uh, Texas does, as California does, as uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, some of the markets in the state does. Uh, uh, so in terms of the way we regulate electricity, we have uh, uh, converged to the type of structure or the type of, of industrial organization uh, scheme that is used by most advanced nations, the, the nations with which we trade and the nations with which we, uh, uh, the ones we would like to would like to resemble in terms of economic development in, in probably in some decades from now. So, uh, but the first thing is to start uh, speaking that language. So this is uh, one thing, uh, one way of looking at reform in Mexico is moving in color to blue, uh, the, the Mexican uh, uh, country. This was published a couple of years ago when the reform was still uh, in its infancy in Mexico and it was an estimation published by uh, some researchers and published as a working paper in, in an IMF series and it basically looked at the impact that reform could have on different uh, areas in Mexico and I would highlight this 14% and this 2.2% and that's the impact that they estimated that we would see in Mexico in terms of growth in manufacturing output and in terms of GDP growth. And manufacturing is a big thing in Mexico. Manufacturing is was, uh, what is driving our export sector. It, it really is a very important uh, sector in the relationship between Mexico and the US. And before the reform, we basically were competing to gain a presence and market share in manufacturing export markets. Uh, despite the fact that we were handicapped by, our industry was handicapped by paying very high electricity prices. So what this paper said is if Mexico converges with the US, uh, basically we would expect manufacturing to grow, to grow by 15%. And the other uh, interesting thing is in the two years since uh, the administration started, uh, the, the reforms were passed and the three years since the administration started, we have seen this price convergence in electricity, industrial electricity prices between Mexico and the US. So uh, that whereas it was above 80% when this administration started, it now depends on how you measure it, but it is uh, very close to the same level in both countries. It was 10% cheaper on average in Mexico or 2% depending on the, month, uh, on the month you measure. And it must have been impacted a little bit by the uh, uh, exchange rate uh, movements, but it is very much in the same levels as the US, and that's a, a great development in Mexico. It's still a lot cheaper in Texas, but, uh, well, not a lot cheaper, but cheaper in Texas, but it's not as cheap as it was, uh, 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 it is not as different as it was a couple of years ago. So, and this one is more recent, it was published by, uh, it's one of those OECD country studies, it, it, it is the Mexico study, and it basically shows uh, the impact they, ha they expect that some of the reforms that have been implemented in Mexico, that have been started in Mexico, will have on the economic growth. Uh, this is last year's estimate by the OECD. And the interesting thing is uh, when you compare electricity and gas or oil with uh, telecommunications, which is a, a very important reform, and you see that uh, energy reform has 10 times the impact on Mexico's economy, at least in the estimates of the OECD, as telecommunication reforms does, which is a very important reform. So uh, this is a very, very, very uh, important uh, engine for growth in Mexico. And in that sense, it is, uh, I think, and I would like to take uh, Duncan's question to the former panel, I think it is a huge uh, reform for Mexico, energy and electricity as part of the energy reform, and for North America as a whole. It is a, it has an impact on North America through Mexico, but it definitely does have an impact on the region. Um, uh, well, I'll just skip some, or I'll leave this. <laughs> this is basically, uh, and it's important to, to remember for us, at least in Mexico, what we hoped to achieve when the reform was started. And the reform was predicated in Mexico on the basis that it would lower electricity prices and that it would in incorporate more clean energy into our, our generation matrix. And the whole design, and we'll go uh, and I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit more about that of the market, was uh, a market design uh, built with clean energies embedded into the design so that it was 
uh, going to give us competition, but also incorporation of clean energies. And that was part of what we wanted to achieve. That was also uh, one of the elements that people wanted us to achieve. When you uh, asked people and you looked at the polls conducted before the reform and afterwards, what people wanted from energy reform in Mexico was cheaper prices, cheaper electricity prices or energy prices in general. And they also wanted a, a, a cleaner energy. Those were the two things that when you measured them in the polls, they were you know, very high on, on the concerns of people. That's also what concerned industrialists in Mexico, all the large uh, industrial groups, the mining, the uh, steel, uh, and the manufacturing industry in Mexico. So it was a case where, uh, well, those were not so much concerned about clean energy, but they were concerned about cheap energy anyway. Uh, but those, uh, that's what, uh, it is important to highlight this because uh, it really is a reform that matches very well what the democratic and the political will of the Mexican people is. Is basically, they if they have us people in, the bureaucracy or in technical parts of government or uh, produce something that gives them that, that's something that they will support in the end. And uh, it will be very important in terms of uh, uh, achieving the long-term uh, 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 inertia that this reform has started and to have this uh, remain in place and, and be developed in the next uh, decade or decades, in the decades to come. Um, I'll skip over this. Um, well, this is an important slide, and it basically shows what <laughs> we wanted to see Mexico's industrial structure in electricity look like uh, after we conducted the reform. And it was an industry where we had uh, an independent system operator in the middle, which was independent from CFE. We had a spot market, uh, we had a, a set of auctions conducted by Senase and regulated by the Energy Regulatory Agency, uh, where we had a separation in all the different segments of industry so that we had uh, uh, companies uh, participating in a separated way in generation, in transmission, in distribution, in uh, retail, uh, either regulated supply or qualified user supply or, or unregulated supply. And uh, the first thing to, to notice about this is this is what we wanted to achieve, but this is a little bit what the industry has started to look now like nowadays. So uh, very soon after the secondary legislation was passed, two years ago, we created uh, this SENACE, this independent system operator. We extracted a part of CFE, of the National Electric Utility, that basically was in charge of conducting the operation, the, the system operator, uh, which was the uh, subdirección uh, del SENACE, the uh, under the direction of the Senase, or, uh, and, uh, and uh, we created with that organization and with those uh, 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 different systems and material resources, we created Senase. We also took another part uh, away from CFE, which was the part that was in charge of planning and with dealing with uh, interconnection applications, and we bundled all of those together uh, for the creation of Senase. And that took place three weeks after the secondary legislation was passed. Uh, a couple of weeks after that, we had all the different applications, the filings that had been done by uh, electricity generators for interconnection with CFE be transferred to Senase, and it started operating right away and in a seamless way. So. Uh, it didn't cost money, unlike what we saw happen in the oil and gas sector when the uh, uh, gas pipelines were taken away from uh, from Pemex that led to a very long negotiation for how much would uh, uh, the government pay Pemex to, to get those pipelines assigned to Senagas, which was the operator for the gas pipelines. But in this case, it, 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 it was processed seamlessly without payments, and even with the union, with CFE's union, which was uh, a big actor and who could have had veto powers for, for this process, we managed to get a good negotiation. And in the uh, course of nine months, we, we managed to have this uh, new operator, independent system operator, operating with all the resources, with all the personnel, with all the new functions that the reform assigned uh, very well. Uh, uh, the other thing is basically, uh, which is also at the center of this, is the spot market and the auctions. And we started 
working on a, a document called the market rules and particularly on the core of this document which were the market bases and it took us nine months to negotiate that with all the different stakeholders in mexico all the different companies and it's a very complex uh, document as all the market rules in in, in different markets are and but it basically uh, uh, spoke a different language from the one we were used to 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 speak and the good thing was that after hearing more than a thousand uh, comments from industry all filed through the electronic system for regulatory improvement that we use in Mexico, we managed to get a consensus uh, document. And right afterwards, we published the business practice manual for the long-term auctions, and it took us three more months. And after that, the very day we published those rules, we launched the first uh, long-term, uh, the first auction for, for renewals, for clean energy sources. And it also, I describe in detail this process because it gives you a sense of what it was like to start building these institutions. There was a sense of urgency, but there was also a very intense process of communication with the relevant stakeholders, formalized, done through electronic filings, taking into account different uh, elements presented by, by the companies, by, by the different groups, by the energy regulatory agency, by, by the people at Senase, by people at CFE, and we managed to get some consensus documents. And uh, that's, uh, I think, one of the keys for, for, for how we have worked and how we have been until now, I think, uh, relatively successful in pushing this reform ahead is basically that we have worked building consensus, we have worked uh, uh, creating rules with the participation on all the different people, and those uh, different actors have been willing to give us trust and to uh, let us proceed and, and develop these uh, very complicated and uh, complex institutions such as spot market or auctions. So uh, as I mentioned, we launched the first auction in November. We finished it uh, in March this year. It took us four months. Uh, it's also remarkable. People in other countries, uh, countries such as, uh, I don't know, uh, Chile, they take a year to organize an auction, and we managed to pull the first one with, within a period of four months. We're fina finalizing the second in five more months, but in a, uh, in, in a, a period of time that takes us from the end of November last year to the end of September this year, we will already have conducted two very important auctions for the incorporation of clean energy in Mexico. The spot market, which is a different story, we started in January this year, and it was a, a very difficult th thing to do, uh, for us at least. Uh, we started with few participants, but if you let me show you one of the... Uh, ah, this slide here. Uh, it basically uh, tells you the story of who the market participate participants in this new spot market are starting to be. And you not only have CFE, but CFE is separated in sev several entities. They are still not operating independently, but they will do so at the end of this year. But they already, uh, they have created, incorporated different companies, and uh, they have the, the new CEOs of these companies have been appointed, the independent board, board members, and the board members in general of these companies have been appointed as well. And you have a growing participation of different uh, national and international companies in the uh, spot market in Mexico. So it's, uh, uh, it, uh, and the list of people, and probably Guillermo Garcia, who is here, will tell you about all the different applications that they have at the Energy Regulatory Commission for uh, permits to become uh, generators or suppliers of energy in Mexico. The list is growing. So uh, it is for us a very encouraging fact the fact uh, that in, in both the processes, the market processes that we have started, y be it the long-term auctions or even the short-term market, and despite the fact that we have so little history of working for these institutions, we have managed to get uh, companies interested in participating and seeing these uh, institutions as vehicles for making money and for uh, developing their business plans. So that's, I think, an encouraging story, and it's developing, it's unfolding as we speak. So we hope by the end of the year, this, uh, in the last three weeks, I've been I in a couple of events in Mexico, in one I met uh, Duncan, and it's interesting because these events are uh, catered and directed to a segment of uh, market participants that didn't exist some months ago, which is basically companies interested in retail, in selling electricity, 
in the other extreme, not in generating it, not these large generators, but actually in finding new and creative ways of selling energy to different types of customer. Yesterday I took play, uh, part in a in a panel uh, organized by uh, uh, KPMG, K P M G. <laughs> sorry, and uh, uh, it was directed to that market segment. And earlier we had another panel with people who were interested in becoming uh, market participants in this area. So I think we'll close the year with a market that is ga has gained, a short-term market that has gained in the number of participants and also a little bit of depth, which is key for, for its uh, development in the next years. Uh, okay. There is another process which I think is interesting, at least to talk a little bit about it, and it's um, it's here. As you know, we come from uh, structures which are monopolic uh, originally, and in the electricity sector we had a small uh, inroads made by private participants, either in the self-supply scheme or as IPPs, as uh, generators and contractors with CFE. And uh, when we decided to move and to develop an electricity market in Mexico, it was deemed as uh, totally necessary to, to have legal separation take place in CFE, to have a str uh, the company restructured so that it would in the operate independently in the different market segments and that it would not uh, uh, collude, the different uh, participants would not collude or otherwise wreck the market or unduly influence it. So it was very important in terms also of generating trust for the new entrants to the industry, for private participants, so that they would know they would have a chance at competing and that actually CFE would not be an impediment for, for their eventual growth in Mexico. And uh, uh, by the end of last year, the 28th of December last year, we published a resolution mandating the, the separation of CFE, the creation of five subsidiaries in generation, uh, five different Yenkos, uh, uh, and a subsidiary that would administer the old uh, PPA is with the IPPs, the, the contracts with the, uh, these uh, companies, which is basically a vehicle for, for representing them in the, in the, in the market. Uh, we mandated also the creating, uh, creation of a transmission subsidiary, a distribution subsidiary, and uh, two um, companies uh, uh, for the supply of energy, one of them them for basic service supply for, 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 for these heavily subsidized residential customers, and another one for qualified retail, for the large industrial customers, which would not be subject to rates established by the Ministry of Finance, but would be free to, to reach bilateral uh, uh, PPAs with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, industry. So the interesting thing about this process, it's a process that norm normally takes uh, uh, many years to develop in, in, in other countries, and we started it in by the very end of last year, by the 20th of December, and in the first half of this year, uh, the CFE uh, managed uh, or created, it was mandated to do that, uh, the different subsidiaries, uh, they were the incorporation charters were published in the Mexican official gazette, uh, the CEOs of the new companies were appointed, the, the their appointments were published last week, and the new independent, uh, uh, the, the boards, including the independent mer members, were also uh, uh, appointed. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we uh, assigned uh, the, the different generation plants to the different Yenkos, and it was an interesting process because uh, it basically it was a process in which we decided to assign a generation uh, plants to the new CFE Jenkos, uh, taking into account uh, market power. So basically that none of those Jenkos would have market power in any of the regions, the nodal regions in Mexico, or either in, uh, or I and also not in the national market. It was a process that uh, had to guarantee that all the different Jenkos would have enough income to be uh, financially viable, but also they would have a uh, their portfolio of generation plants would be split so that they would have to compete against each other. And then all this, uh, a part of the, of the resolution on the terms of strict legal separation of CFE, also included a set of Chinese walls to prevent them from colluding, from, from bringing prices, etc. So it's a, th that's a part of the reform which is very important. To give you an idea of the meaning of CFE for Mexico, it is probably one of the three, four largest companies, depending on how you measure it by assets, 
uh, by the number of personnel it employs or, or by, by its sales. Uh, but it is really a very uh, important company, not only in financial terms, but also in terms of its presence throughout Mexico. You can see CFE signs uh, throughout the country. Uh, they are uh, a well-liked company uh, in terms of which is an important thing in terms of if you're in the public sector where people tend to look at us and see us as bureaucrats or obstacles to growth or, or other things. But CFE is well liked. It's sort of like the postal service uh, used to be or is still in, in the US. And uh, when uh, uh, hurricanes hit some regions of Mexico, they are the ones that come and repair everything and the population likes them. So it was also a very c delicate thing to, to separate, to split the company even if within the same holding in several parts. Uh, the union, the CFE union, is also a very powerful union. So it was also a process that demanded from us a lot of negotiation and, 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 uh, uh, and talking to the different representatives from, from the workers. So, uh, but until now, it has also proceeded uh, more or less seamlessly, and we hope that it is working well by the end of the year and next year we'll see some of the effects on that. We believe that uh, uh, the separation of CFE in several subsidiaries is not only good for competition, we also believe it's very good for CFE, that will it will help this company to become more efficient, that uh, uh, whereas it was a good company, it lacked uh, layers of uh, oversight at different levels. It was, uh, uh, so, and, and this separation, I think, will hope it become a better company, more well managed. Uh, so I've talked a bit about uh, the electricity market. Uh, I'll just spend, I, uh, I think I'll have probably a couple of minutes or, or I, I'm over two minutes, okay. So I'll, I'll just close very quickly with, uh, uh, <coughs> I'll leave the presentation here if anyone wants to take a look at it. Uh, here, this is a part which I haven't uh, talked much about. But the reform has a very important part, which has to do with the uh, creation of infrastructure. I uh, was lucky to uh, give a presentation to a group of economists in Mexico earlier this year, which is called the Grupo Huatusco, and they have been asking themselves the same question in the last 15 years. That's the, uh, the leading question that generated this seminar, which is why Mexico, uh, why is Mexico not growing? Uh, why is Mexico not, not growing faster? And there are two sets of explanations to explain that. One basically says, well, we haven't done the reforms and there is no competition in Mexico. And the other set of uh, uh, answers to this question basically says, well, we have not built enough infrastructure. And one of the good things about this reform is it has both elements. It has the element of markets, competition. It also has the element of uh, having uh, been an instrument for the development of infrastructure. And you can see that in these uh, two slides I will gloss over very quickly. This one shows you the development of pipelines in Mexico, uh, gas pipelines. Uh, a, a French CEO uh, from one of the top French companies, multinational companies, uh, once in a visit to the Ministry of Energy quickly commented, well, Mexico's energy reform can be summed up in a line. It's basically it consists of bringing cheap natural gas from the United States and generating cheap electricity with it in Mexico. And that's one way of looking at it. And this slide shows you why that story is partially true. And it's basically that we have developed in the last years a, a set of, of a, s a new system of pipelines that uh, goes through a region of the country that was not served before this administration started. Uh, pipelines in Mexico tended to be developed here in the coastal region of the Gulf of Mexico which is basically where Pemex's operations were, where it extracted a, a, a gas from, from basically this, this area of Mexico. And it also is a region that is close to Texas. So uh, some pipelines had been built between Texas and Monterrey, which is a large industrial uh, city in the north of Mexico. But this other region was uh, uh, neglected, basically because Pemex's operations were not there. At the start of the administration, CFE started uh, using its... Uh, uh, its ability to anchor uh, the development of pipelines uh, linked to uh, gas-fired generation plants uh, to uh, jumpstart the development of new trunk uh, gas pipelines which go in this part of Mexico. And by the end of the estimation, we will probably have a make the system of, the of gas pipelines in Mexico, uh, these uh, big trunks, grow in 75%. So it's, a, it's one of the very important uh, 
uh, achievements that I think that the energy reform will, will, will have. The other one, you can see it in this other slide, is basically uh, the development of transmission lines. This is a key element of the reform, and it is key for the incorporation of clean energy sources. Basically, when you look, for instance, at the uh, wind resources in Mexico, they are concentrated in two regions. Here in the Tehuantepec region, in, the, uh, uh, in this uh, isthmus of Tehuantepec, it's called, which is the, the part where the two oceans are closer in Mexican territory. And in this part in Tamaulipas, th those are wind-rich regions, and they are not very well connected nowadays to the large consumption centers, which are in the center of the country or in this part here. So uh, that's uh, uh, one of the reasons that you want to have, and I just give you this as an example, you want to have transmission lines that uh, unite large pools of, of cheap generation with uh, the areas where you have the, uh, the largest demand of energy. And uh, this administration, and we'll probably in a couple of weeks, have the first tender for the development of a transmission line done, done by private parties in association with CFE. It will start to build this pipe, uh, this is the trans uh, large transmission lines. Uh, two other transmission lines are worth mentioning, one that connects uh, the Sonora region with Baja California. Uh, and uh, this is a, a sun-rich region and also has very good wind in this, in this part. And it allows us to connect two systems that have not been traditionally well connected in Mexico. We had what we call the national interconnected system, which connected most of the country. But Baja California was an isolated system. It was better connected with California in the US than with uh, the rest of Mexico. So we'll finally have, uh, by the end of the ad this administration, a, a national system in Mexico. It will be also good for trade uh, with the US. And there is another line on the consideration, this one has not been ordered to CFE to construct, which is a project that goes from east to west or from west to east, as you want to, uh, to look at it. It allows for trade between regions in Mexico. It makes sense in terms of Mexico's uh, internal, need, internal needs, but it also, if it connects with Texas and with California as it should, uh, uh, provides opportunities for increasing security, reliability, and trade in the whole uh, North American region, the whole border region of Mexico and the US. So uh, this is the infrastructure part of the reform, which, uh, which is also very important. So I think I, uh, uh, I probably have uh, uh, exceeded my time, but thank you very much. Thank you. Yes? I'd li we have time for about two questions before we move on to our panel on Mexico. So uh, if anybody has a, a pressing issue, there's one hand gone up straight away here and another one at the back. Those are my two questions. Sure. Um, um. Uh, sorry, there's, uh, I think there's a microphone at the back there. So we'll get that question at the back and then we we'll come to you, okay? Uh, hello. Please, please at the back. <coughs> go. Yeah, Jeffrey Watson, uh, Solar and Energy Corp. I guess the question, based on the last uh, piece of information we received from the um, first presenters, if in fact the last statement you made about the uh, internal transmission pipelines, uh, if that provides so many positives, why is that one third versus first or second? Sorry, I missed the last part. Why you is just that? Presented, you, you just showed us a diagram yes. indicating three internal this one here? Yeah. Okay. Three, three internal transmission lines. Yeah. Right? Based on the last information, because I have a bunch of questions, but maybe this will help uh -huh. uh, me. Yes. Um, if, in fact, there are so many positives for the last transmission line you presented. Yes. Security and what have you. With Reliability, yes, trade. Uh -huh. Why is that the last one oh. versus the first two? Sure. Which seems to be more important for both internally, Mexico, and the connection to North America. Sure. Um, I think that uh, for these two lines, there are many uh, uh, transmission projects that uh, involve, uh, for instance, the, the, the states here, which are uh, uh, shaded in green. So th there are lots of projects uh, throughout the country. And uh, for these lines, these, these are they have the characteristic of being uh, having been uh, studied and approved as HPDC lines, which is uh, uh, this new technology for transmission. And uh, it's also a, 
and I didn't mention that, and I should probably have, uh, they are being built with uh, project finance mechanisms, which is basically they are not being built by CFE, as the rest of the transmission lines have traditionally been in Mexico, but rather by CFE in association. CFE is the contractor, and it basically calls for a tender where uh, large uh, groups um, or consortiums uh, bid and, and, and finally are awarded the line, and they are, uh, th they are the ones that will develop the line in time. So it has several challenges. It, it, it is a new contractual model. It's a model which requires pri private participation. It's a well-tested model because many countries have used it before. But uh, for Mexico, it, it, it presented two challenges. The technological challenge, we have not done, and we have not done until now, any HPDC line in Mexico. This will be the first of its kind. And we have not done any schemes of project finance of this uh, 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 auction, these uh, tender processes and these new contractual models to have a private uh, company, a private consortia develop this, these lines. So it was a regulatory challenge and a technical challenge in terms of developing all the rules for the participation in these tenders. Uh, also, for e this line, the Tehuantepec line, had been a project that had been waiting in line for like uh, seven years. It had been thought of as a project that would be constructed before. All the uh, land use rights had been contracted before, so it was well advanced. Uh, there were uh, many uh, companies that wanted to take advantage of the line. Uh, so that was a good project to start with because uh, a lot of work had already been done, the cost-benefit analysis had been done. It was only a matter of changing the technology and the type of, of mechanism used for building and financing it. Uh, the other one, the interconnection between Sonora and Baja California, had also been well studied. It was well developed. And this one, this was a, a, it, the, the, the one I mentioned last, this large transmission line that runs on the south of the U.S.-Mexico border. It is really a byproduct of the reform. Mexico, before the reform, thought of its electricity system as an isolated system, as if we were an island. Uh, we didn't see opportunities for trade. We saw ourselves as uh, a system that had to be interconnecti interconnected with itself, but not with uh, other countries. It changed when the, when the uh, reform took place. Uh, planning was not done anymore by CFE, but it started to be done by the ministry. And we started to look at Mex to, me in, uh, to Mexico in terms of a, a, a part of a larger region, a region that connected with North America and also with, uh, with Central America. So uh, projects that have not uh, been thought of because we didn't see the, the world be be beyond our borders or we didn't see it so much, uh, uh, started to make sense. That's, that's the reason it was left in the end. Thank you. Um, over here. Hello, uh, my name is Enrique Enriquez. I am a student at the University of Georgetown. Um, my question is, what are some of the things being done or that you think should be done uh, but to enable and to incentivize Mexican companies that are not in the utility sector to produce their own energy, especially clean energy, either to for internal usage or for selling to their other companies or even to their communities. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think what one of the benefits of the reform, at least from my point of view, is basically that uh, uh, we changed uh, from thinking about companies producing their own electricity for their own use, and we started to think in terms of looking at specialized companies do that for a lot of, of, of uh, private users. Uh, it, is still, it still makes sense for, for companies which are in very isolated parts to, to build some generation plant or who have some industrial process to use their steam or, or some of the uh, byproducts of their activity, if they are, for instance, in forestry or in other, in other things, and they produce some, something that can be used as fuel. But in general terms, I think it makes more sense to go to specialized supplier because they, they are very experienced and, and know how to uh, really match your demand and, and, and the supply opportunities that are up out there. And also uh, for companies to go to the large companies that specialize in generation, that are very efficient, that have all these economies of scale, and buy the electricity from them. So uh, a way of seeing it is we have moved from the old uh, self-supply schemes that were part of the reform that was started in the 1990s, the early 1990s, to a more uh, uh, new generation type of schemes, whereas specialized companies uh, 
who know how to do something specialized in that and others uh, buy from them and they have ov obviously many options to do that in, in the new market so I would uh, the old schemes the self-supply schemes uh, are still available so people who have all projects who had permits under that scheme can still go on producing uh, their own energy but I think that the new forms would be more successful and, and provide better flexibility and opportunities for, for the companies. Uh, Mr. Under Secretary, thank you very much for being with us. Congratulations on everything that you've achieved so far, and uh, we look forward to seeing the full development of this market in the remaining two years of the administration. So there's still lots of work to do. Um, and please uh, come back and visit us again soon. Many thanks, Cesar. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please bear with us. We're going to take about uh, a minute and a half just to switch over everything up here. Um, our, our, our webcast team are also switching over. Um, they're making a break in the recording so that then it's going to be much easier to, uh, to download for people who want to watch it afterwards. Um, but in the interim period, I'd like to invite our next panel, uh, in particular, Jeremy Martin, who will be moderating uh, this session. Uh, Guillermo Garcia, uh, gl glad to have you with us, and David Goldwyn. Please come up.